It's our own Peak District. And a staggering 17 million people make day visits here every year. It's so accessible that you can leave your home in Sheffield or Stockport and be here in the Peak District National Park in a matter of minutes. I like to get away from, from civilization um, as far away as possible from anything deliberately man-made and man-created. You feel the outdoors, you can smell the vegetation, you see the wildlife, you sense the weather. I know it sounds a little bit romantic to say that you feel the wind and you feel the wet and the cold and, you know, it gets red and your fingers tingle, but that is the attraction of being out of doors. When a motorcycle freedom relates to the fact that you're in control of a machine that is an extension of your own body. In the car you sat behind a windscreen, you sat in the frame. On a motorcycle you sat in the scenery. You're not like a television viewer looking at the world through a frame. People love horses, people love scenery and pony trekking you get the two things together. You don't have to be an expert. You can enjoy trekking on these moorlands if you've never been on a horse before. The best way to train for climbing is to actually climb. You can go in a gym as much as you like, but really you're never going to get that good. And once you're actually climbing, it builds up not only your strength and your stamina, but it also builds up your head, we call it, it the ability to climb when you're high above the ground and actually do the moves when there's the possibility of a nasty fall. Climbers, riders, ramblers, of all our ten national parks, the peak suffers the most from overuse and conflicting interests. For some groups it's a wildlife sanctuary, but for millions it's a handy green bit for recreation. And 20 of those millions live in the great cities that ring the peak park. Each weekend, people from the northwest discover that the peak's beautiful countryside is only a short drive away, making it a day trip paradise for townies. Michael Dower has the tremendous task of stopping the Peak Park from being used to death. How does he view his patch? Well, it's 540 square miles of moorland in the north and east and west, and then the southern part of the park of limestone valleys and hills, heavily farmed, uh, and in the northern part, water catchment lands, which are surrounded, so surrounded by cities that it's a sort of playground for all the city regions of the Midlands and the Mid-North. Although Michael Dower is steering the Peak Park through this European Year of the Environment, it was his father who led a conservation campaign throughout the 40s, arguing that urban sprawl and industrial expansion would destroy peak countryside that the cities had already polluted with soot and sulphur. But conservation carried little weight at a time when entire villages were disappearing under the 54 reservoirs created to quench the thirsts of Manchester and Sheffield. The Peak Park might never have been, but for the people of those industrial cities. Great clashes took place between gamekeepers and ramblers pressing for the freedom to walk on all open land. Eventually, the government tried to please both conservationists and walkers with the National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act of 1949. This gave the controlling board of the new Peak Park two contradictory roles. To preserve the natural environment, but also to open it up for walkers. Although the ramblers of the 1980s now have access agreements to over half the peak's open land, they're still preoccupied with the legal battle for the rest. If you had a magic wand to do what you liked as an official of the Ramblers Association with the Peak District National Park, what would you do? What one thing would make everything wonderful for you? A legal right of access to all open country as defined in the 1949 National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act. It's, what, 50 odd years since the mass trespass on to Kinder, you That's know, right. to get access up onto these moors and to the openness here. Is the battle over now and the strife done? No, no, by no means. We, we won a battle in the war, but the war is still to be won. That's interesting you call it. Why is it a war? It's a war because it's going on for such a long time. 
Uh, when the 1949 National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act first reached the statute book, I think people were hopeful and they envisaged that in a fairly short length of time, huge areas of open country would be accessible to the general public and it's not happened. It's been a very slow process in fits and starts. Is it feasible that it should all be open to the public? <clears throat> yes, we believe so. We believe that there should be a legal right of access to open country as defined in, in that act. Fifty years on, the Ramblers are still striving for their goal of open access, but their opponents have changed. Naturalists now oppose their aims because they feel that wildlife will be threatened if the public wander all over the moors. Recreation and conservation still need to be reconciled. If you're talking about future access agreements on moorlands, and there are several being discussed at the moment, then we would like to identify areas where there are either particularly sensitive um, plants or high concentrations of birds or other animals, and we would like to put forward a case for sanctuary areas, for example, areas which wouldn't be open to, to public access, areas which were quiet and undisturbed, and leave the access in more planned, say, corridors, zones round those, or on concessionary paths, and we feel that there's much better control uh, and less disturbance in that sort of situation. But only a small percentage of the park is actually owned by the Peak Park Board itself. So it has to persuade private moorland owners into agreements for the public to use their land. Park rangers are the middle men in these agreements and they have to deal with infringements. So when it's the holiday season and an owner closes his moor for grouse shooting, the rangers find themselves on patrol, protecting the walkers from the guns and the guns from the shoot saboteurs. Two walkers here, Gordon. We've got to have a word, I think. Yeah, I hope so. They could be going to the Hello? Oh, hi. How are they They're going far. Just over the moor. What, over to you, Dale? Yeah. Hi. Um, only the, the moor's closed up here for shooting today. Oh, yeah. Is it? If you could take an alternative route, I'd appreciate it. Sorry mm. about that. OK. Oh, OK. Right. All right. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Let's establish first these moorlands are of national importance for their wildlife. It's not just the ground nesting birds, the golden plover, the dunlin, the curlew and so on. It's the whole of the environment, the topography of the area, the, the, um, the heather moors, the high cotton grass bogs, all of it together is of national importance. Now let's leave aside the malicious threats to the wildlife, the things like the badger digging and the illegal bird stealing or the egg stealing. Um, those are horrifying and they're additional threats. Let's look at the unintentional ones first. I think we could list those. The first one, I think probably the most important one, is actually fires, summer fires, big extensive fires in dry weather, which can destroy the vegetation. If it does that and the peat's exposed, then you get erosion. Once you've got erosion, you don't get revegetation. It, it, it is that drastic. Many fires you find burnt out cigarette ends in them. I mean, it's usually people smoking, just walking along, throw it away, and there it lands on this highly combustible peat, which in Ireland, they cut it up into chunks and put it on the fire, and it just burns. On the top of, you know, Kinder and Bleaklow, you're talking about anything up to 14, 15 foot of peat, and it can burn down into this. It can burn for, well, we've had fires that have lasted for, you know, six months and, or more. And once the peat's gone, then you're down to bedrock and you've, you've nothing then. This terrible erosion was caused by fire, but a fire that raged over a hundred years ago, the moorland still hasn't recovered. But erosion can also be caused by overuse. Ecologists point to the Pennine Way and argue that ramblers must be controlled because 100,000 pairs of boots leave Edale each year to walk this famous route. When the mist comes down, they just follow the mud. This is the motorway of the Pennines, deep peat, which is called the Pennine Way. Thousands come here to visit it. I can't think why. I wouldn't walk on this. It's so muddy now. Peat is such a fragile material. It, it's just dead animal and plant remains. And when it's wet, as you can see here, it's just a very intolerant surface for people to walk on. I'd like to bring anybody up here and show them the mess on the Pennine Way to try and convince them that planning footpaths needs to be so carefully done to avoid these deep, wet, peaty areas. And this is where a lot of the birds are breeding. In fact, it's so bad that in places they've had to cover the peaty surface with what really looks like an urban footpath, which, which is, I think, terrible in a, in a sort of wilderness environment. And the board's job is to do two things, to protect the landscape that we inherit um, and enhance it if we can, 
and to provide for the 17 million visitors a year that we get to the park. Let us take the Eastern Moors as an example. There, where it's our own land, so we were able to work it out uh, quite readily, we were under pressure from the ramblers to allow access to the whole of the moor and from the naturalists to protect the rare species of birds and other features which were on the heart of the moor, which they felt would be damaged by widespread access. This stone could well mark the site of the battle for Big Moor. In fact, the actual fracas took place down there in the village hall. It began when the board took over Big Moor to the east of the park. On one side were the naturalists who felt that the moor had been overgrazed and wanted a sanctuary to allow the plants and animals to recover. On the other side were the graziers and other local people who felt that their problems had not been taken into account. When the crunch comes, we've been told by government that if they're in direct conflict, then conservation, that is the protection of, of the landscape, of wildlife and of archaeological features and so on, that that should dominate. The riders felt the crunch most. We've been training it for about three years and really I don't know where I can take it if I can't take it there because I have to do 12 miles work a day with it to keep it really fit. Bridleways and tracks have existed across these moors from time immemorial. They were the routes along which pack horses took goods from town to town and these stones were the signposts. This one says Tideswell, six miles that away. But as modern roads came along and tarmac Adam surfaces, these routes fell out of use. Even so, today's horse riders and pony trekkers still feel they have an ancient right to ride along them. We get a great number of tourists here, a lot of pony trekkers from all over the country, a lot of them from inner cities, have never been on a place like this, and uh, we hope that they would open up the old routes yeah. for riding you, again. You, did you get what you expected? No, not at all. How do you feel, not Michelle? Not very pleased. <laughs> uh, we'd like to be able to take our riders up that come riding into the area. And we're only allowed to go ourselves with a pass like this that we have to pay £10 for. They've made us a route, but they've made it as hard as possible. You feel a bit daft, really, riding along with the bright orange armband. If it dropped off, you'd lose it, and then you might have lost your key if you've got it in your armband. Every gate is padlocked up, so you've got to get off, unpadlock it, take the padlock off the gate, take your horse through the gate while it's dancing up and down on its toes, and then you've got to get your arms back around the gate to get the padlock on, and you've got to lock it up with the key because they're not self-locking. There's about six gates in just about half a mile that you've got to get on and off to do. It's a real bind, you know, if your horse is jumping about and when it gets excited because you're in big open space. Stand, Geraldine, stand. This awkward path, with all its gates and locks, is only a small concession to the horse riders. It isn't a legal bridleway, so the board can close it down at any time. What's more, only 50 people have been granted the privilege to ride it. I can't have 10 passes for 10 ponies. I can't take the tourists up there at all, which I think is a great shame. They're very narrow roads, and we get a tremendous amount of traffic, and it's very difficult. You've, you've got to get off the road. People live within 50 miles of this park, and bank holidays, you would think that half of them were coming here. <laughs> Feels like that. Well, you can't move here in bank holidays. I mean, I've known as many as 100 people in the field down the road because it's accessed near to the river and, and cars go in and, it, you know, they don't do a lot of harm if they'd only park and, and leave no litter and not let the dogs out. But, I mean, as I say, these are things we're having to live with. We don't like them, but we're having to live with them. What has happened over the last 20 or 30 years is first that more people have come out into the countryside. It's kind of gone down through, as, as car ownership in particular has gone down through the population, people have come out into the countryside who didn't before. Now we're having the second wave, as it were, of what is happening in that, is, which is that people are more aware of what it is they're in. And so they're no longer coming out frightened of adders and bulls and, and so on, you know. And that means that they're no longer concentrated in particular places, but wanting to penetrate the countryside. Now, if we can at the same time tell them that it's not just a park, 
It's actually a place where the farmer's growing grass and through it growing sheep and get them to understand that that means they've got to control their dogs a bit, then that's fine. The serious person who comes out and parts his car and goes for a walk, know where he's going and what he's going to do, keeps to the footpath by whatever laws in the locality. But it's the other people who just come out, out of the town and park the car, they don't really know what they're going to do. And they might go 200 yards or they might go a mile. But they just make themselves a nuisance because, you know, I mean, they play football, cricket in the morning field and these sort of things. And these are the kind of people. It's not the genuine walker. And we get more and more of those because there's more leisure time. Everybody's got a motor car, a lot of people have got two. And this is going to get worse. Surely the climbers of the peaks can rise above these problems, but they have their own. Our main worry is basically access um, in terms of question of just being able to get onto the crags legally. We would support the Ramblers' aims for open access because while we require open access in areas of upland country, particularly to the north of the Peak District, we also require rights of way across uh, farmland that's been cultivated to get from the road to the crag. Uh, similar to canoeists, for example, who need to carry their canoes from the road to the river. What we would look for in, say, five, ten years' time is in situations where there have been rock climbs that have been recorded for over 25 years to actually be rec regarded as the right of way, so to speak. Oh, that's yeah, that's yeah. This is a very hard route that has got a hard move quite high off the ground, which you don't really want to try. <laughs> A trick that sometimes people do is you try it when there's a big snow drift underneath the crag and then if you fall off then you, you just land in the snow and then your friends can come and dig you out. <laughs> yeah. But naturalists are concerned that the climber's impact on wildlife, especially on the birds. Climbers themselves are very conservation orientated. They don't want to go out and disturb birds' nests. At the end of the day, however, as the peregrine falcon, for example, becomes more successful in its nesting, I think there will be increasing pressure for us to only climb, say, from July onwards. I'll be ready to turn you off now. OK. It's not only uh, rock climbers on some of the, the edges in the Peak District. The hang gliders is a new recreational activity. It's not something that's been researched in particular, but if you imagine these great hang gliders hanging over the edge of, of the rock faces to a little bird, they could look like an oversized bird of prey and, and could actually act as a major disturbance agent. There's an increase in all sorts of activities in, in open country now. Um, I mean, we've got things like hang gliders, paragliders. We have pony trekking, you know, horse riding people with model, model aeroplanes and if you just take three users walkers horse riders and motorcyclists all using a bridleway they all conflict is there any group of users in this park that really get up your nostrils uh, yes to be honest and I think it's not an uncommon complaint is the trail bike riders because a lot of people who are going into the peak park for recreation are looking for peace and quiet and trail bike riders, by the nature of their activity, destroy that. There's also an argument that they do more damage to the environment than a pair of boots ever could. It's not a use where countryside is a necessary ingredient to the activity, and I think that would be where I would put the basis for those. We're talking, I mean, specifically about trail riding. Right? Yes, yes, correct, yes. I don't think noisy pursuits are, um, are compatible with the countryside. The bony fide trail rider um, is a responsible person normally. It's the cowboy element that we have difficulty with. The people that run along tracks that they're not supposed to run along or run along the open moorland, of course, where they're not supposed not to be at seen. all. Um, and, and they come dressed for the part. They take off their registration plates or cover them up with peat. And we're on foot. I mean, it's impossible for us to catch up with these people. But woe betide any cowboy motorcyclist that rides into this posse. They ride as the fellowship of trail riders who stick where vehicles are allowed, and they're sick to death of those irresponsible cowboys. We have a code of conduct, which really is common sense. You keep the speed down. It's not a racetrack. We're out to enjoy the day, to enjoy the scenery. We keep the noise down to an absolute minimum, and although a motorcycle can make a noise, but a modern motorcycle intelligently ridden is virtually inaudible a hundred feet away and we try and become part of the countryside just like a walker. A lot of the trouble arises because 
take this road as an example, there's a sign behind you, Bob, and it says it's a bridleway. There's also an unclassified county road. Now, a walker might say, it's a bridleway, you shouldn't be here on a motorbike. But it's an unclassified county road and we jolly well can be on it with a motorbike. We tend to ride them very often in the middle of winter, in foul conditions, where walkers just don't venture out. But we enjoy it, it's a challenge. If we came up here on August bank holiday and there were 300 walkers, it wouldn't be fun for anybody. We're quite realistic about this, we don't do it. We keep out of the way. I've seen them uh, a few times on the moor up here, on the bridleways, and they've always been very pleasant. They've slowed down, they've stopped uh, and waited for us to go by, and f absolutely fine, no complaints whatsoever. At the stroke of a pen, you could say that motor vehicles are not going to be allowed on these roads anymore. But that's not going to stop the cowboy element coming because they don't care about the laws as they stand anyway. So you're only going to harm a few people like ourselves. You couldn't stop motor vehicles physically coming anyway. If you're going to keep the road open for horses, a motorcycle can always get through. So I would argue that education is the way around it. Let's hope that the Trail Riders Fellowship can stop the noise and erosion caused by the cowboy riders. But it's a bigger job stopping this. Every year, five million tonnes of the peak park are trucked out by juggernauts careering down country lanes. The demand for limestone is continually increasing and the big mining companies want to step up their operations. Certainly the pressures on us are more severe than any other national park. We have a total of something like 360 mineral working sites, which is massive. Mostly limestone and fluor spar. And uh, it's a very heavy pressure upon the landscape of the park and in terms of the traffic, the mineral traffic, and in locally, local places, the dust and the noise and so on. We have clear-cut policies that where applications are made for new quarries or expansions, they must prove that it's in the national need, that there are no alternative sites outside the national park, and that they can do it in a way which is compatible with the park. I think it's vitally important that we conserve these moorlands. I think it's a duty that we have to future generations. They've been here for 2,000 years, maybe more. I'd like to see them there for another 2,000 years at least. I think it's important that they are. You know, for it to retain its character, it's got to be looked after and there's got to be respect for the people who live there. And I think that's the message I would pass to people. I totally agree with that, but add to it that I think people should come and enjoy themselves. Uh, and there's a good old saying, it's a very old one, is that they, uh, they take only photographs and leave only footprints. And if that is the case, then everybody wins.